I was talking to our director, Danny Regan, just before we started talking about this, and he's quite a sports expert and enthusiast. And he mentioned something I think was kind of interesting to me. He said, why is it that only football players like to play in their bare feet? You never hear of a pitcher or a third baseman who insists that he can't play and wear shoes at the same time, or a golfer, or a basketball player, or a soccer player. But there always seems to be at least one kicker in the NFL every season who kicks barefoot. Of course, they inevitably have to play in the middle of a snowstorm, and it kind of gives a whole new meaning to the term cold feet. By the way, the Yacht Club boys weren't just a group that was pulled together for this movie. Uh, they were a popular collegiate quartet at that time, back in the 30s. They wrote all of their own material, too, including that song, Down With Everything. Uh, oh, and they weren't the only performers who played themselves in Pigskin Parade. I should mention Sam Hayes, the radio announcer. He was a popular radio personality of the 30s, and his voice kind of added a touch of authenticity to this 1936 movie. We'll be right back, but first let's take a look at this. This is what we call an American movie classic. We wish we had more time to show you why. The stars, like George Montgomery, Ann Rutherford, and Cesar Romero. The future stars, like Jackie Gleason and Harry Morgan. The fabulous dancing of the Nicholas Brothers. Or the immortal music of Glenn Miller and his orchestra. you'll just have to see for yourself when American Movie Classics brings you a look at the women behind the band in Orchestra Wives. It's part of our big band celebration, premiering Wednesday, October 29th. We're back, and before we go on, I want to alert everybody who's a Betty Grable fan that November is going to be the month where we pay special tribute to this superstar of the 40s. She was acclaimed America's favorite pinup during World War II, and that over-the-shoulder swimsuit pose graced footlockers all over the world. Among the Betty Grable Technicolor musicals coming up next month are Down Argentine Way, Diamond Horseshoes, Sweet Rosie O'Grady, Coney Island, she was terrific in that, Mother Wore Tights was another one. Her leading men are going to run the whole gamut, from Don Amici to Dick Haynes, Robert Young, George Montgomery, and my favorite, Dan Daly. I also like Dick Haynes. I like the others, too. I think Dan Daly best. Now, Whatever the plot, you can be sure that America's favorite girl next door is going to sing and dance at one point and show off those best of the gams in the business, too. So but you know what gams are? You're too young, right? You'll find out when you watch Betty Grable. Be with us in November for this terrific Betty Grable gala. Now, we'll be right back, but first, here's something special from our film archives. American Movie Classics presents Inside Hollywood. Tonight, our West Coast correspondent, Nancy Collins, interviews screen legend Dorothy L'Amour. Dorothy L'Amour started her career as a band singer and then came to Hollywood in 1935 to star with Ray Milland in a film called The Jungle Princess. From here, she went on to make a series of classic road pictures with Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. Known as the beautiful sarong girl in these films, Dorothy once auctioned off two of those legendary sarongs during a World War II bond drive, raising two million dollars. Dorothy has been retired from the screen since 1963. Let's talk a little bit about the road pictures, because clearly those are, I guess, some of your more famous films. <laughs> how, how did that first road picture come about? One version is at Paramount. I uh, had a picture they wanted uh, Jack Oakey and Fred McMurray or somebody like that to do. Or the girl in the middle. And my version is that I was sitting having lunch with Bing and Bob one day at Paramount and uh, two writers were sitting there and they wanted to know what I'd been laughing at so much. I said, you want to sell a story to Paramount, write it and put the girl in the middle and I'll be her. And that's my version. Now the set I got, it was fairly loose. You know? That's right. And. Uh, well, like I did in any other picture, and I studied my, my script, and I, I learned the dialogue I was supposed to do that day. 
And then I went in and they started to ad lib and I was standing in the middle and finally Bob still tells his story on me. I looked at each one of them and I said, come on guys, let me get my line in. And so I never did learn it anymore. I would just ad lib. I used to call myself the highest paid straight woman in the business. <laughs> Yeah, you thought you'd get away with it, huh? Get away with what? We're married, bud. You're married. I'm sorry, Scat. This is the man I love. <laughs> My dream boy. Oh, please, honey, not in front of strangers. Why don't you get a barrel and go over the falls, son? We'll check with you. How do you like this? And close the door tight. All the time I thought she was in love with me. Take it easy, honey. This doesn't figure. It doesn't figure at all. I'd have known. Deep. Dorothy, when you, when, when they first suggested that you wear the sarong for the Jungle Princess, what was your first consideration? I died. <laughs> because I, I, when I was in the beauty contest, I was so self-conscious of, of everything. I, of my, my shoulders were too narrow, my hips were too wide, my feet were too big. <laughs> Uh, I thought I was flat-chested, but I wasn't quite. <laughs> but anyway, I just died. Is that considered a racy thing for you to do at the time? Oh, certainly. It was terrible. Uh -huh. Edith and I decided in one of the, the uh, South Sea Island pictures to make a two-piece sarong with a bra and, and a, a short skirt. And we shot for two days, and the censors made us come in and reshoot the whole thing because it was too, uh, too much nudity. Really? Oh, so wrong now is like long underwear. You know, when you, uh, when you met your husband, and you, it was a wonderful story. I mean, you virtually looked up and saw this fabulous looking man and yeah. fell in love. It's like a movie. Yeah. Uh, did he want you to give up your career? Was there a problem? No. No. We had a very strong discussion about that before we were married uh, as to whether we, we wanted children, uh, whether I should go on with my career. And uh, when I told him I would be very happy to give up my career, he said no. Because he said, in 10 years from now, uh, you'll sit by and say, that's what I could have had, and you took it away from me. Mm. So he was a very understanding guy. He knew that I get happiness out of working. Although I've lost Bill, I know he didn't want me to sit at home and, and twiddle my thumbs, which I did for six months. Mm -hmm. And until my kids came to me and they said, Mother, go back to work. The doctor says, go back to work. My friend said, go to work. And I was sitting with my little uh, Scottish Terrier. And so finally one night Coco and I were looking at television. He was sitting on the ottoman. He was just about that big then. And uh, uh, all of a sudden a picture came on. I'd seen the play on Broadway and it was Barefoot in the Park. So I've done that for two years. Uh, I did Sondheim side by side last mm -hmm. summer. Uh, I'm going to do barefoot in the park again. Mother! Hello, Mom. Oh. Oh. I can't breathe. Take it easy, Mom. I can't get my breath. Well, you should have rested. I did, but there's always more stairs. Paul Hilper. Come on, Mom. Watch the step. More stairs. <laughs> oh. Do you want some water? No, thank you. Not yet. I can't swallow you. Oh, sit down, Mom. Oh, my. Well, it's not that high, Mother. No, it isn't bad, really, dear. What is it, nine flights? <laughs> Five. We don't count the students. If I'd known the people on the third floor, I'd have stopped to visit them. Do you think you might ever remarry? I doubt that very seriously. You never say never, but I doubt it very seriously. Mm -hmm. I have my life kind of almost arranged again now where I love to work, so I work. And I've got uh, my little secretary, companion, friend. She's 28, and her name is Donna. And she lives here, and, and she's almost like a daughter to me. So she kind of keeps me young with younger people around. And last but not least, I've got my Coco. Would you like to see Coco I would sometime? I'd love to see Coco. Is Coco around? Could he come here? I think. Ask Donna to bring Coco, will yeah. you? Want to see the camera? There's the camera. There's the camera. Look, that's Coco, mm -hmm. and he's my little boyfriend. <laughs> he's my little boyfriend. Look at the camera. See the man over there, and that's Nancy. You say your mother's talked out, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
you're watching American Movie Classics. This month, American Movie Classics presents Burt Lancaster as the all-star American Indian athlete, Jim Thorpe. There's one thing that really gets to me, it's sports. And Charles Bickford as Pop Warner, the man who discovered Jim's talents. Either I need a new watch or we've got a new runner. I want to go over there to the Olympics. I want to make a record they won't be able to ignore. Sir, you are the greatest athlete in the world. Jim Thorpe, winner of the pentathlon and decathlon in the 1912 Olympics, pioneer in the first professional football league. But an innocent mistake stripped him of his medals in honor and turned his Olympic triumph into tragedy. We Thorpe's would never break up. Now, the channel that brings you 50 years of Hollywood presents the exciting and heart-wrenching story of Jim Thorpe, All-American. It's an American movie classic, Sunday. We are back, and before we return with another selection from our film archives, I would like to tell you one more time, anyway, that next Tuesday's musical double feature, it just packs a great wallop. First, Ann Southern and Gene Raymond are the romantic leads in Hooray for Love. The first-rate musical talent includes Bill Bojangles Robinson and Fats Waller. What a pair those two are. Then, our second feature, Sun Valley Serenade, features the sound of the great Glenn Miller Orchestra. And the remarkable Nicholas Brothers are in this, too. Of course, it's a uh, Sonia Henney movie, Sonia Henney specifically, and John Payne star with Joan Davis and Milton Berle, too, at a very young age. And they provide a lot of laughs. We'll be right back, but first, here's that other selection from our film archives. <laughs> Movie Classics presents Hollywood, the early years, featuring the great films and legendary stars of Hollywood's silent days. The early serials were dominated not by husky heroes, but by the ladies, the serial queens. And the greatest of these was Pearl White. Vivacious, a pleasingly natural actress, Pearl White was a symbol of her times of woman's struggle for political and social equality in the early 1900s. Instead of just demanding equality with the men, Pearl showed that she was their equal and more. At a time when movie heroines were coy and helpless, Pearl White was dashing and self-reliant. White's first serial, and still the most famous of them all, was The Perils of Pauline, made in 1914. The Indians believe Pearl to be a long-awaited goddess. If she survives the ordeal of the rock, her immortality will be proven. If not, then her sacrifice will appease the gods. With the First World War in progress, Pearl's enemies became spies and saboteurs. Here, in 1917, in a serial titled Pearl of the Army, she's on the trail of the master foreign agent, known only as the Silent Menace. We commented earlier on Pearl as a symbol of woman's fight for equality. Over and over, as if to emphasize this, She'd take on the male villain single-handed. And 
continued it was, chapter after chapter, with Pearl ever close on the heels of the silent menace. Once in a rare while, Miss White would exercise her feminine prerogative of being womanly. She'd let herself be rescued by the hero. Is the unmasking finally at hand? Hardly. This was still only chapter five, and the audience was way ahead of Pearl in figuring out that this was only a red herring and not the silent menace. Just before 1919, Miss White gave up cliffhanging to star in full-length society dramas. But in her last feature, Made in Paris, she came back to the kind of role her fans liked best. Even the title signified a return to the pearl white of old, The Perils of Paris. None of Pearl's serials were made in Hollywood. For her backgrounds, she used the still wild landscapes and mushrooming towns of New Jersey and New York. This film, Plunder, in 1923, brought to a close the career of the greatest of all the serial queens. The plot was about buried treasure, but all that really mattered was Pearl's brand of fast action. Plunder is one of the rarest of all the Pearl White serials. This episode was copied from the only known surviving print. Quicksand. chance in a thousand. Pearl bowed out of movies while she was still on top, leaving her work as a yardstick for all who came after. Before Pearl White, there were other serial queens. The very first, in 1912, was Mary Fuller, whose What Happened to Mary series was produced by Thomas Alva Edison's own movie studios. Helen Holmes, of the Hazards of Helen. Railroading was her specialty. In every episode, she was in action on, and very often nearly under, a speeding locomotive. Then came Helen Gibson. The airplane was in its infancy then, and the automobile and locomotive still represented the ultimate in speed and power. Standard equipment in a hundred different serial plots. Villains have weakened a trestle. And Helen has to get there in time to prevent the wreck. But of all the serial queens who followed Pearl White, only the beautiful Ruth Rowland was a serious rival. Ruth 
Roland specialized in outdoor adventure and daredevil stunts. Serial is Ruth of the Rockies, and Miss Rowland has little choice between two consistent enemies, fire and water. So it went, week after week. But as the serials smashed their way into the 20s, the ladies relinquished much of their dominance. Women's votes and other rights were now accomplished. And, as if in keeping with social progress, the serial queens were now content to do their cliffhanging under the protection of a much more authoritative male hero. Other changes reflected the march of events. Tempos were faster. The heroes, like Herbert Rawlinson here, were breezier and more dapper. The high cliffs of the mountains were pikers compared to the man-made chasms of the big cities. Ten years had gone by, but the password was still continued next week. We are back. I hope you enjoyed those marvelous selections from our film library. I did. Uh, tomorrow's dramatic double bill features two classic stories made into first-rate motion pictures. First, child star Eddie, uh, Freddie Bartholomew is absolutely winning in Little Lord Fauntleroy, the famous story of a poor Brooklyn kid who inherits a British title. Mickey Rooney, Dolores Costello, Ethel Barrymore, and C. Aubrey Smith co-star in that. It's a classic movie. Next, Charles Lawton. Let's talk about classics. He stars in Victor Hugo's classic tale, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, Maureen O'Hara, Edmund O'Brien, and Cedric Hardwick co-star in this touching story of the deformed bell ringer and his love for the beautiful Esmeralda. Set in Paris during the Middle Ages, it combines the best in literature with the best in movie making. Don't miss it. Now, here's today's movie question. What steadily employed character actor usually played a cowardly neurotic? He was Lawrence Tierney's accomplice in Born to Kill. I'll have the answer for you tomorrow. For American Movie Classics, I'm Bob Dory.
If you missed any part of today's film, stay tuned. We're going to show them again. again and welcome to American Movie Classics. I'm Bob Dory and today is Tuesday and if you want to see stars you want to stay tuned today. Our musical twin bill features both the old and the new troopers of the stage and screen. Stars too who were to become household names. Let me tell you a little bit about it. First in the light-hearted musical confection Playmates, Shakespearean actor John Barrymore joins band leader Kay Kaiser and that Mexican spitfire Lupe Velez in a show business vehicle it features comedy experts Patsy Kelly and Peter Lind Hayes. Next, Hollywood pulls out all the stops in the football musical comedy Pigskin Parade. Stuart Irwin, Patsy Kelly, and Jack Haley headline in that one, but you want to watch for the future stars, and they number Judy Garland, Betty Grable, and Tony Martin among them. That's a pretty good cast of supporting players. Now, let's do the answer to yesterday's movie question. What famous comedian and stage and screen star was born Joe Yule Jr. Well, the gifted performer and longtime headliner is, of course, Mickey Rooney. He made his movie debut in Not To Be Twisted. I'll have another question later. Right now, oh, because of a schedule change that we have, you want to pay close attention to today's movie clock for correct feature times. We'll be right back. Imagine, if you can, being on the set of John Barrymore's last movie. The year was 1941. Barrymore, one of the greatest actors of the 20th century, is about to perform. Now, at the age of 58, his drinking problem is so severe, he can no longer memorize lines. He's forced to use cue cards, which in those days were written on blackboards. His concentration wanders. His memory is bad. He is, in fact, burned out. They're doing a scene in which the stage veteran is to recite Shakespeare. A glimmer of his former greatness begins to shine through. Barrymore began to recite To Be or Not to Be, the speech from Hamlet. It began as a joke in the film, but as he began to intone the lines in that matchless baritone voice of his, the sound stage crew began to become very quiet. The attention of every person involved in that production became riveted on the man under the lights. The lines were all there. They were on his blackboard, but he didn't need them. Not for Shakespeare, not for Hamlet. He did the speech with such power that hardened crew members who had seen it all began to weep, and by the time director David Butler whispered, cut, tears were streaming from Barrymore's face. The actor broke the spell by calling his tears the worst tasting gin he had ever tasted. No one who was present on that soundstage that day in 1941 will ever forget the spark of greatness that was still present in the wasted Barrymore the great actor of stage and screen. Let's join John Barrymore in Playmates. <laughs> 